who discuss assessing the economic and environmental benefits of industrial water use efficiency in the Great Lakes region. My name is Mary Ann Dickinson. I'm with the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and we're very happy to be presenting this webinar to you today. Uh, welcome. Uh, the webinar will be 90 minutes in length, and we have a full 30 minutes slotted for your questions. Um, what we've done with this webinar is muted everyone on the webinar, um, and the audio that you'll receive uh, through for the webinar is either through your telephone or it can be through your computer. Um, so either way, you should be able to hear the audio from the speakers. Um, there is a dialog box for the webinar. If you see a little orange square with a white arrow in it, and if you click it open, you will see that um, it opens up a screen that shows you a, a chat box. And in that chat box, you can type in your questions all throughout the webinar. You don't have to wait until the end. But what we'll do once we finish the presentation is we'll answer all of your questions at the end and have an opportunity for you to um, you know, provide some comments or, or questions or issues that you would like the speakers to discuss. Um, we will keep the phone line muted during the presentation and during the question and answer period. Because we are recording and we have discovered through our experience in the past that when we uh, don't mute, we get a lot of background noise from the attendees and it, it distorts the recording and makes it unlistenable. So we've adopted this procedure of muting all of the participants and it makes for a clean recording, makes for the ability for people to listen to the webinar afterwards. And uh, we, we hope it doesn't impair your participation. As long as you can type in your question in the chat box, we will be happy to answer it. So we have uh, four speakers that are uh, going to be talking to you today on the webinar. Uh, in addition to myself, we have Thomas Pape of Best Management Partners. We have Jeff Edstrom from Environmental Consulting and Technology, and Ken Mervis of The Writing Company. Uh, all of the speakers were active participants uh, in the project that we're going to be describing to you. And um, we'll start with just a little bit of a project background. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Tom, who will launch into the project itself. But just by way of quick background, it's a 24-month project that we undertook, uh, began in January 2011. And the project was funded by the Great Lakes Protection Fund. We're very grateful for the funding assistance that they provided for this work. And the project was designed to evaluate industries and the opportunities for water efficiency in those industries, but particularly only to look at those industries that were served by public water supply systems. We knew that many industries actually had their own uh, either their own water supply or they withdrew directly from one of the Great Lakes. We were interested in where you, industries could productively save water and what the impact would be of that saved water uh, when it was delivered by a public water supply system and sometimes even treated by a public wastewater system. Um, the project is, com is completed, uh, was completed in December of 2012, but we are continuing to do outreach work when we're, we're funding that ourselves at the Alliance for Water Efficiency. So we'll be, in addition to this webinar, we'll be doing presentations on the project around the country and continuing to do published articles and uh, hopefully some additional uh, media work. The project team included the, the speakers that are on the webinar and as well as a number of others who are listed here who were involved in the various aspects of the, the project. It was a, a, you know, a complex affair involving a number of people. I want to give a special shout out to William Hoffman who was our project engineer on the audits, and also to Townsend Albright, who was our loan development advisor. Uh, both of those uh, team members are not on the webinar today, but they were very key members of the project uh, in going forward. We also had an advisory committee composed of a number of experts in the field who gave us uh, terrific advice during the course of the project. I think 
We had about five or six meetings with them where they advised us on the types of industries to target, which industries to choose, how to uh, compile the, the results and what kinds of uh, information would provide valuable. Uh, so all of the names that are listed here in this slide are people that I, I particularly want to acknowledge because their participation in this project greatly enhanced uh, the deliverable that we were able to produce. So just as a, an overall project goal, what we were really looking to do is to figure out how we could achieve environmental benefits in the Great Lakes ecosystem by demonstrating sustainable water use reductions in the industrial water use sector. The Great Lakes Protection Fund is um, very much devoted toward improving the ecosystem health of the Great Lakes. So uh, changes in environmental benefits and in ecosystem health was something that they were particularly interested in having us look at. So that was a, a main goal in the project. It wasn't just to see where we could productively and cost effectively save water in, in industrial um, water uses. We, we knew that was certainly possible, but to go that next step to achieve the environmental benefits. So the method that we came up with was first to reach out to industries in the Great Lakes, um, first to create an awareness of proven technologies, uh, but also to offer our, our um, opportunities for efficiency to make sure they, they understood that, that we were actually offering technical assistance to conduct or verify any benefit cost analyses that they might like to do. Um, an audit, an on-site audit is critical to doing that, so we wanted to offer uh, that as part of the project. We, it was important that we guaranteed confidentiality to those industries, so you will not see industry names. Uh, in this presentation, and um, that's for a very good reason. We, we looked at a lot of proprietary processes, and without that guarantee of confidentiality, we would never have been let in the door. But once those audits were done, we wanted to identify the barriers to implementing the recommended actions from those audits. Uh, we recommended a number of efficiency actions, which Tom will go over, and so the barriers to implementing those were an important part of our project analysis, as well as creating a way to get some of that funded. Um, and we wanted to create a structure for low interest loans. Um, we thought that might be a phase two of the project down the road. Uh, to help offset some of those uh, early implementation costs. And we'll talk a little bit later about um, our survey results on how important some of those industries thought it would be. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Thomas Pape, who together with Bill Hoffman worked through a number of the, the um, industries, helped select the industries that we actually audited, and he will uh, talk to you about how that happened. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, Marianne spoke a little bit about the, the target market. Um, I'll go a little deeper into that. We are trying to look for common water use in the industrial sector throughout the region and looking for industries that were sustaining in the area um, or actually growing in their, um, their, their, their presence in the Great Lakes area. Uh, because we're looking this as Part of this was the ability to forecast what we could do in the future. Um, if we had audited industries that were uh, leaving the area or closing down, it wouldn't do much for the forecast. Uh, we were also looking for high volume, but that was not necessarily a high volume water use within a particular um, site it was, because some sites weren't particularly large, but there were thousands and thousands of these types of sites within the region. So we looked beyond high volume just for a particular site being high water use. We wanted to see was there multitudes of those also in the area. Next slide. So the industries that we came up with and uh, I worked with Ken Mervis on this quite a bit, was uh, pharmaceutical was pretty high in the area, although that the presence seems to be reducing somewhat. Um, agricultural product processing was large um, throughout the area. Uh, we did have some resistance in the food industry uh, because they are under so many regulations already. They were somewhat hesitant to have us come in. 
Um, beverage and food production, uh, we did get into that area. Dairy products, certainly we we're looking at. Appliance manufacturing um, was pretty big in the area. We were able to get um, some headway in there. Plastics, either the molders or the um, injection molding. Vehicle manufacturing, now most of the car uh, manufacturing facilities do a direct draw from the Great Lakes Basin and direct discharge. But there were smaller ones such as motorcycles, um, lawn vehicles, um, uh, ATV sort of things that, that were available to us because they were using water directly from a uh, public facility. Metal play platers. Uh, we were at one of the largest ones. They, uh, it wasn't really all that big, um, but uh, certainly there's thousands in the area. Um, so that takes us to the manufacturer. Uh, was one of the sites we, uh, we I think, or we jumped ahead a little bit, didn't we? We seem to, yeah. Oh, now we're. Are we on the right slide now? Okay. Now, if we go one slide more, the target, you know, one forward. Uh, then we were looking for uh, participation by the industries, the implementation of measures, um, water use reductions, how much water use we were going to look at. Uh, we could get out it, financing feedback. If financing was an issue to impede the um, the implementation of water efficiency, what type of financing would be attractive to them? Were they looking for low interest loans? What would be the loan uh, type um, parameters they would need to take advantage of it? Doing the benefit cost assessment and then of course the environmental assessment at the end. Um, next slide. So the industries we selected, we got a beer brewer, um, which that was just a heartache to have to spend three days inside of a brewery. Um, it, it drew from, now when we look at the source water, if you look at column three and four, that is the source water for the water supplier and the receiving water is where the wastewater service provider discharged the effluent. So none of these were direct draw. They were all through a, a public uh, water provider, a public wastewater servicer. Uh, we got a leather tannery, which is huge in the area. Uh, as it turns out, um, wherever you see meat processing, you're going to find the tanneries uh, because the, the hides have to be immediately um, started the production of the leather. They can't sit around. Uh, we have uh, manufacturer, we have a metal plater, plastics compounder. Uh, if you look at the receiving water, the source water, you can see we got a pretty good variety, which we were hoping for, as the type of whether they were going out of the surface water, the lakes, streams are coming out of the aquifer. Of course, these were all within the basin. Next. So overall, we got 66 million gallons per year of savings from the what were the cost effective um, uh, measures that could be implemented of course they all did not all get implemented but this was the the estimated savings if they had been implemented uh, reduced water wastewater flows of approximately the same there's some evaporation and some use within the product for instance a beer uh, we couldn't save the water that went into the beer and gets shipped out to the taverns and such. Uh, we had a remarkable payback time, 0.2 years to 5.8. Average was 1.2 year payback. Now, uh, some people have commented that no business would take a 5.8 year payback. We did not decide, presume what the payback period would be. When we went to the site, we asked the um, administrators at the sites, what is the longest payback period you would even consider? Some said two years, some said three, four, some said seven. Uh, so we only put really in the report and count what was within the payback period of the individual site of their desired. So if they didn't want anything over three years, 
and we found a four-year payback period on a, a, a measure, we did not include that because it was beyond what they were willing to go. Uh, the average annual return on investment, 84%. That is uh, pretty good. I, if if I uh, could get that, uh, I think we'd all have a nice retirement plan. Next. So here we'll go the findings by the individual sites. I just wanted to get your brief overview. Uh, plastic compounders. Uh, we big issue there. Now I will tell you something else about these sites. Is generally people who want to participate, they generally think they don't have a problem because they're, if they had a big problem, they wouldn't want that exposed and the embarrassment of it. So all of these sites had a pretty active program to try and use water efficiently. Uh, but at the plastic compounder, just because it was a different set of eyes, we found a huge saving on the surge tanks. It had to be had, had how they were operating the surge tanks and the equipment on them. Uh, for a relatively very small investment, we could fix the problem um, and they could save almost 2 million gallons a year. Next slide. They also had uh, cooling towers and we looked at that um, and it was changing from about 2.5 to go up to 4 uh, cycles of concentration. Uh, again, a very short payback period. Um, and so we assess that. Next slide. Then there was the uh, sanitary fixture in the place. They didn't have a large workforce, but they had enough that, and they had rather old fixtures, and we looked at changing out the toilets, the urinals, the uh, um, um, uh, wash basins, etc. cetera, um, and we got a 47% uh, return on investment. Next slide. So the work completed, uh, they already started a minute we got finished with and sent them a report. They started changing out the flow restrictors. Um, it said work to be completed within a year. I think it's almost been a year, so it's probably complete by now. Uh, the toilet sanitary fixtures they were going to replace as a normal upgrade. They were looking to upgrade the facilities anyway. Um, part of the issue is when this facility was built, I believe, it was assumed that there would only be male workers in the facility before it was something else before a plastic compounder. So they actually uh, were changing things out to make better facilities for uh, the men and the women. And they also, with their, didn't really need to have showers anymore. So they, and the original facility had showers. Uh, they were looking to change that out. So they were going to make this part of their change up. Uh, company is very satisfied with the cooling water regiment of the. Um, uh, the um, the um, um, evaporators, the uh, cooling system, the cooling towers, so they wanted to just keep it at three cycles of concentration, so they really weren't planning on changing that. And that's somewhat typical in industry, quite honestly, is, you know, if the, if the cooling system goes down on them, uh, it shuts down their production. Therefore, they always will err on the side of excess water use rather than take the chance that their production would be shut down because the cooling system failed. Next slide. So the biggest obstacle they had was personnel. They uh, capacity wanted to do it in-house. They didn't all the work. They didn't want to do it, bring somebody in to do it, and their uh, maintenance and facility crews um, uh, were limited in how much time and they would put it on their schedule and were planning to make the changes. But it wasn't really an issue of money because none of the change outs cost very much. In their case, it was most an issue to slow them down was the personnel uh, having the available time to make the, the retrofits. Next slide. Manufacturing. Um, the manufacturer had testing uh, labs set up and they were testing the appliances they made, um, basically life cycle testing. And they were doing accelerated testing, meaning they would just run these appliances 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and get them through so that they could basically see what would be the wear and tear on the product in uh, 10 years, but they would abbreviate it down to about a month or so. They would be able to get the 10-year wear out of it. Um, 
and they were filling them up with water and dumping the water immediately. Uh, so what we looked at um, was taking the, the testing water and they also had a re, um, reverse osmosis discharge water which was still fairly clean. Taking that, putting in a holding tank and reusing that water within the testing lab itself. Uh, wasn't a real uh, extensive retrofit um, but you can see it was it would pay for itself in less than, in about a half a year. 181 percent return on investment is pretty good investment. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at the f this facility. They had quite a few workers there. It was a very large facility. Looked at uh, replacing the cafeteria equipment um, and the sanitary fixtures. Uh, the cafeteria equipment mostly in the kitchen, the food steamers, that sort of thing. Um, sanitation fixtures were all the bathrooms, uh, restrooms, and uh, we looked at about a 3.3 year payback period. Again, fairly short, uh, certainly uh, a, an investment I would make if I owned the facility. Next slide. Uh, at this facility, because it was manufacturing, it was basically mostly on one level. Uh, they had a very large footprint of their building. Um, and we figured out we could probably get as much as 5 million gallons a year by harvesting the rainwater off of the uh, roof. One of the great things about the Midwest is that it gets lots of rain, lots and lots of rain. Um, the problem was really that they didn't have a place for their storage tank. One of the problems of the Great Lakes Basin if you collect rainwater and such is that you um, if the tank's outside, you have to put every freeze protection into everything, or you have to shut down and drain the system during parts of the year when there's uh, when when it could freeze. So they really didn't want to. Although they had thought about it, they said, you know, don't bother um, doing much on this. Is something that I don't think we really want to do, um, but it is it is something they could do in the future. And certainly, as Jeff's going to point out later. The, there is great benefit of the environment in stopping the stormwater surges. If you can imagine 15 acres of land all hardscaped and all that water going into the storm system, uh, so there might be some additional uh, benefits that could be utilized by the facility at a later date. Next slide. The obstacles to implementation for them was really the time needed to fit the work into the budget cycle. Uh, there are the the water efficiency measures have to compete with a lot of other issues they're trying to work with within the system. Uh, all the other type facility changes, the change outs, improve the production line, uh, general maintenance, um, everything from painting to repairing stuff. It, it had work within that time frame and the budget. Next slide. The metal plater. Um, they had already done quite a bit at this facility. Uh, they had already done conductive uh, controllers to limit the rinse water on the waste. They used counter current rinsing for these um, objects they were plating so that they were constantly whatever was the uh, first water for the or the last rinse, the cleanest water would then be recycled to be earlier in the cycle, um, so they were only really dumping out the last rinse each time and trying to reuse. Um, and they had level sensor controls to make sure they didn't have overflow, which um, was a big issue before. Next slide. So we looked at, and they had thought they had done pretty much everything they could do at the time, and uh, but of course our engineer got in there and noticed that the rectifiers, the rectifiers are kind of like transformers that provide the electric current to the plating arrays, um, which makes the middle uh, it, that's in solution attached to the parts. Uh, and those have to be cooled with water. They were using single pass cooling. Uh, we were looking to um, reuse that water because they could reuse it through the rinse cycles and such. Uh, looking at saving three million gallons annually. Again, um, about a three year payback period with 33% return on investment. Next slide. The leather tannery, um, this was an interesting place to go. Um, 
they really they used a lot of water, and I think at the time that we they were one of the largest or the largest water user for the uh, water supplier in the area. Uh, as you can see, they spent over a million dollars on water and wastewater. Um, a lot of the wastewater issue is because there's so much suspended solids inside of the water. Um, this facility took the raw hides, and when I say raw, when we were there, it was a it was rather a cool day. And as the hides were coming in, being delivered from the meat processing plant, you could actually see steam coming off the hides. They were still that warm from being on the hoof. Um, and they come in with all the hair and hooves and ears and all sorts of stuff that all ends up in the wastewater stream. Next slide. Uh, what you're looking at a picture, it's a little hard to scale, uh, but those are the hides inside one of the mixing tanks. And to give you a scale, the opening was about six foot in diameter of that round circle. And that was the opening for a tank, which is basically looks like a ginormous um, cement mixer tank. Like you see the cement mixer trucks. And these tanks uh, swirled around to agitate the hides in the solution and the different solutions they were using. And they also had hydraulics on them to raise them and lower to dump out the hides and dump out the water. Um, so the, the picture doesn't quite give you a full idea of, of the scale of this, but it's, it's huge. Uh, the hydraulic system, and you have to understand there were some over 50 of these tanks, and the hydraulics were always raising and lowering. You can imagine this tank full of water, the level of hydraulics you needed to move this stuff around. Uh, the hydraulic cooling system water was basically a single pass cooling, and we were looking, we looked at a measure to reuse it. Uh, again, saving 11 million gallons a year, 43% uh, return on investment. Next slide. Uh, the physical constraints were really the problem. Uh, this facility was built to the max within a couple of feet, probably the full limit of how close you could build to the edge of your property line. There was no place to go. There was a, a train track on one side, other facilities around it, um, and it really couldn't move to a new location because it had to be near the meat packing. Um, so it was difficult for any reusing of the wash water, which it could have been cleaned up and treated. They could have had a kind of a mini preliminary wastewater treatment. They could have reduced their costs on the, um, the sewage costs because they could have greatly reduced the suspended solids. They could have reused the water. But it was just an issue. The footprint just wasn't going to allow it to happen. Next slide. The beer brewery. Um, uh, in the brewery industry, they started to create a metric, and that metric is mostly based upon the number of gallons of water used per gallon of beer produced. Uh, they were at 5.6 gallons of water per gallon of beer, um, which was about average for the industry. Certainly, there's many brewer brewers that do much worse that are over 10 gallon. There are some that report 3.2 gallons per gallon of beer. There's one I heard a talk on that went down to about 2.2, uh, but a very small brewer and had a very specialized situation, which, which really caused them to have to get down that low. Um, we came at about the right time. They were in the, uh, the they were, had the beams up and basically just the skeleton of a new brewing facility they were building right next door to their original facility was going to be, I think, five or six times larger. Um, and so they weren't necessarily going to implement all of the measures we had for the, the uh, existing brew house, but it definitely changed their plans of how they were going to build the next one. So we got there. Good time. Next one. Next slide. Uh, we designed the foam control. One of the issues they had was some of the beer, the way it gets brewed, it creates a lot of foam. That foam spills out onto the floor. They have drains on the floor, and they're constantly washing the floor. And this may go on for two or three days. They have a 10 to 20 gallon flow of water trying to wash the foam down. Uh, came up with uh, some measures to change that. Pretty cheap, only about $500, um, and could save over $7,000 a year. And, water and wastewater. So it was basically a thousand percent return on investment or very near. Next slide. 
the other issue is they were hosing down, if you understand brewing, you understand 90% of brewing, as they will tell you, is sanitation. Um, they were hosing down the floors all the time to keep um, the sanitary level of the facility intact. Um, and just using large hoses like a, a one inch or even a one and a half inch hose with something that looked like a small uh, like fire hose nozzle on the end of it. And uh, we discussed with them the use of efficient water brooms um, and they were going to try that out. Thought that would work pretty well for them. Uh, you're looking at 83% uh, return on investment. Next slide. The bottle washing system used a lot of water. Also, the conveyor line that the bottles were on is actually a metal plate tracking, not like a rubber conveyor belt. And you can't use oil because the fumes of the oil, if you tried to use oil or grease, would get in, would um, get absorbed by the beer. It would, would taint the taste of the beer. So there are constant little nozzles spraying a water solution on this track, so water is used to lubricate it and that was spilling on the floor going down the drain and we looked at a system to recover that water and reuse it and um, because it's kind of extensive um, it, you know we're looking at a 5.8 year payback period return on investment 1.7 um, they were also the engineer there had, had talked to us and was looking at another system that uh, he thought maybe they could, instead of trying to reuse the water, they could greatly reduce the amount of water they used to lubricate the track. Next slide. Uh, the wort line purge, uh, basically because of the brewing process and the brew kettles being in one place and the fermenters tanks being in a second place and then the lagering tanks and chilling tanks being somewhere else, they're constantly moving the beer from one end of the building to the other to different areas through large, like, two or three inch um, diameter hose lines. Um, and at, when you, at the end of the beer, you can't pump air, so uh, when the beer is out of the tank and in the line, then they use water to purge to push the beer the rest of the way to the next tank. Um, when that is complete, they shut off the line and at this point, they were just draining the water out of the lines into the sanitary sewer. Uh, we looked at that as a possibility of a way to reuse that water and put it into their clean-in-place system. Uh, it looked at uh, they could save about 5,000 gallons a year, $21 annual savings, less than five-year payback, but they were kind of looking, well, we'll probably look at doing something in the new facility. We probably won't change out. Uh, their existing facility, but they they were planning to do something in new facility. Next slide. Okay, at this point, um, we're going to talk about the environmental benefits, and we're going to turn it over to Jeff Edstrom of Environmental Consulting and Technology, who will walk us through how we did that analysis. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, talking about the environmental benefits uh, from looking at these different facilities uh, around the Great Lakes region. Um, in general, what we found in a lot of the facilities is that uh, reduction in water use will, really lead to, will lead to improved stream flows and aquifer levels depending on, on your water source. Uh, reducing water use at these industrial facilities will have differing impacts depending on a number of factors, and it's particularly helpful when the source is groundwater or, uh, or, or rivers or streams as a water source for the public water utility. Uh, generally, you're also going to see healthier aquatic ecosystems, uh, fish, and as well as terrestrial uh, life supported by groundwater and uh, uh, streams for, the, uh, uh, for rivers. Uh, finally, uh, you're going to see increased air quality through reduced demand uh, for water that will uh, result in reduced energy requirements for pumping. Next slide, please. In terms of the relevant factors, uh, the type of, of water source that's used is particularly important when uh, examining what the environmental impacts are going to be. When you're looking at the impacts of withdrawals in general, a million gallon withdrawal of water uh, is going to have a different impact if it's coming from the Great Lakes themselves, which is a six quadrillion uh, gallon system, or whether or not it's groundwater, and that can even 
uh, differ based on whether or not it's shallow, unconfined groundwater or confined groundwater deeper in the bedrock, or whether or not it's a stream. It also depends on whether or not you're part of a combined sewer system or a separated sewer system. In the Great Lakes, we have a large uh, number of combined sewer systems that, uh, that collect both uh, stormwater and wastewater. Uh, the combined sewer system, in particular, uh, will have dangers for overflows in large rain events uh, that will cause some problems for, uh, for receiving waters. Uh, also, the air quality impacts are going to be related to the uh, embedded energy, and also that, that can change depending on what the energy mix is and what the power, whether or not you're using a lot of coal, et cetera. Next slide, please. Now, I recognize that a number of you on this, uh, viewing this webinar are not from the Great Lakes, so I wanted to give you a better sense of, uh, in the U.S. at least, where, what are the different water supplies for the different areas. And on this map, you'll see where, you, where the areas in blue are served by the Great Lakes themselves, whether it be Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, or Lake Ontario. The orange is supplied by either uh, rivers and streams or connecting channels between the lakes. So when you withdraw from these different types of, of, of sources, you're going to have different impacts. Uh, the gray areas are those served by uh, groundwater. And the little uh, black dots you see are all of the discharge locations for public uh, wastewater treatment plants. And so you're going to see a difference in impacts based on whether or not you're taking water from the Great Lakes and putting it into a stream that goes to the Great Lakes, or if you're taking it from groundwater uh, and, put, and using it and discharging it into a stream as well. Uh, so this is, it's, it's important to get a, a feeling of the context um, for where water is used uh, and where it's going to be discharged. Next slide, please. In terms of the visible effects for environmental impacts, you're going to see changes on levels flows and the quality of the source water. Now, when you're taking water from the Great Lakes, which is 18% of the world's fresh surface water, uh, reduced water use isn't going to have an impact on the levels and flows of the Great Lakes directly. However, once you're looking at uh, streams where you're taking water from, uh, from those for use or from groundwater, you're going to see much more significant impacts uh, once you start conserving the water. Uh, it's not only going to have an effect on the levels and flows, but it's also going to have an impact on the health of the water-dependent natural resources, whether it be plants, animals. Those, uh, those are that life that's supported by, uh, in particular, groundwater, where uh, it's going to uh, help uh, wetlands and other types of, of life. Um, the quality of the receiving waters is going to be very important in terms of the combined sewer system. Uh, it, the, the tannery that we looked at uh, was located within a combined sewer system. And what happens is when there's a combined, when there's a large rain event, you have uh, an enormous amount of stormwater going into the system, which overtaxes the collection and the treatment system. And so you're going to see uh, overflows of untreated wastewater and stormwater going into receiving streams. And so th those extra solids from the tannery or from other facilities that uh, discharge solids into the, to the collection system are going to add to the environmental impacts. Uh, this is particularly important in areas where maybe you've got a smaller combined sewer system uh, and a facility that, an industrial facility that's very large uh, where it's, uh, it's solids that it's put in, put in there increases the risk of, 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 of impact on the environment. It's also going to improve the water supply reliability. If you're using less water based on the uh, uh, industrial conser water conservation efforts, you're going to be taking less water from that bank of the aquifer or the stream. And so there's more available for potentially other users, but more importantly to, uh, to, to the aquatic and terrestrial life and the ecology uh, in the system. Uh, so that's, in general, good for the ecosystem health and protection of the aquatic life, because if you're taking less from a stream or from groundwater that feeds a stream, uh, that's going to be important uh, for providing that, that base flow for the stream. And again, uh, you're going to see uh, reduced emissions again. Next slide, please. In terms of the aquifers, 
you're going to see uh, aquifer and surface water levels staying becoming more re reliable. You're going to see receiving waters experiencing uh, 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 um, some changes as well. Uh, when you reduce the water use, uh, there's going to be less wastewater that's going to be discharged to a stream. So that's going to have an impact on those receiving waters as well. Um, it is important to note that uh, a lot of streams uh, receive a significant amount of base flow from wastewater discharge, uh, and so that will have an impact in terms of, of, of that, but it's moving it probably more towards its natural flows as opposed to uh, necessarily uh, negatively impacting it. Um, and finally, in terms of surface water and aquifers, what we're seeing is in areas where water is drawn from one source and then it's discharged in another location, it's creating a disconnect between uh, two water sources. And I like to think about this as when we're talking about the water cycle, we're dealing with three water cycles. Uh, the, the first is a natural water cycle that we all know about where precipitation comes down, goes through the, uh, uh, through the ground and trickles into streams or goes directly into streams. Um, second one is where there's the water use cycle where water is taken from a uh, water source whether it be surface or ground, it's put through treatment, use, distribution, or distribution, use, and then treatment again and discharge. Where that water is taken from uh, in the ground or, or the surface, it's going to be discharged to a different location, and somewhere in between is going to be an impact on the ecological life. Uh, and finally, a third water cycle that we talk about is the storm water cycle, or the interrupted water cycle where water is hitting pavement, it's going uh, through pipes directly into a stream during a rain event, and it's just shooting through the system as fast as possible rather than being slowed down. <clears throat> Which leads us to our next slide of stormwater management. One of the things we want to do is to try and use that stormwater first uh, so that we can reduce the stress on the water source, whether it be a groundwater or surface water supply but also reuse it so that it allows for uh, the retention of stormwater on site. It's keeping it from being pushed into a receiving stream uh, too quickly. Uh, that's very important uh, because that can lead to uh, certain flooding or, uh, or other events that are going to impact habitat. Uh, so it's important that we improve the overall uh, water quality as well because we're not pushing stormwater through over parking lots where it's picking up grit and oils and other things. You're taking it, you're keeping it in as clean a, a state as possible uh, from the rain event uh, and then uh, using it in, in the system and then uh, making sure that you're using it to supplement the facility's water supplies for an appropriate use, reducing the need for that treated municipal water. Next slide, please. Finally, air quality impacts. I want to talk about this one in terms of uh, we all, there's a lot of talk about the uh, water energy nexus and treatment processes that are uh, very energy intensive. Uh, the lower water demand is going to reduce the energy use uh, for pumping. Uh, and this is eventually going to lead to a reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, what we could look at from the facilities we, we looked at is, or uh, not just the facilities we look at, but overall, uh, over a 20-year period, if we extend this to other uh, similar type facilities to the ones we looked at, uh, it could eliminate a billion pounds of CO2 over 20 years, which is the equivalent of about 100,000 car years. Uh, next slide, please. Scaling the results. The five uh, industries, as Tom talked about, uh, yield in a savings of approximately 66 million gallons per year. And there are about a thousand comparable facilities to the ones that we looked at. And if we scaled that up to the uh, whole Great Lakes Basin region, that would lead to, in the next slide, overall for surface and groundwater and wastewater reductions, potentially 560 billion uh, gallons uh, saved over that 20 year period. 460 billion for surface water and 100 billion for groundwater. And then that uh, would link to, or that would uh, yield a uh, about a 620 million kilowatt hour savings uh, over over that 20 year period. Next slide. 
And then the impacts on emissions are pretty significant over that time as well. Uh, reduction of CO2 by, of uh, about a billion tons uh, and on these other uh, emissions as well. Uh, so what we see is pretty significant uh, environmental impacts over time, but again, the impacts are going to differ uh, based on your location. What's your water source? What's your the, the type of storm sewer system that you use? And what's the, uh, the point of discharge? Uh, and you're going to see impacts on all the points in between that. Next slide. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we're now going to talk about a couple of other issues that we wanted to explore during this project. And one of those issues was utility revenue loss. Were the utilities that were servicing these five industries um, concerned about the lost revenue from decreased water sales? And of course, it was of some significant concern to some utilities and others it was of less concern. It, it, it really depended on the individual situation. Um, so to get a little bit broader uh, feedback, we also surveyed 100, approximately 100 water utilities in the area. Um, 87 of the sample, 87 percent were actually in the Great Lakes Basin. So we were, we were trying to survey those utilities that would be impacted by this kind of uh, water use reduction. Um, and we wanted to explore what their opinions were on this because efficiency improvements are a challenge for water utilities, if, especially if they have a shrinking customer base, as is often found in the Great Lakes region, or a large debt service on uh, an infrastructure system. Um, and in some of those systems in the Great Lakes Basin, there's a great deal of unused capacity. So it's very different than other parts of the country that are finding themselves supply and treatment short in the capacity end. So we wanted to also explore what the economic impact was of, to those utilities. Um, but a number of them did indicate that, yes, they saw that, the, that they would, the efficiency improvements and the reductions in water use actually did reduce their variable costs for uh, pumping for uh, energy, uh, for pumping and treatment, and the, also the cost of the treatment chemicals. And furthermore, where they were expanding their system, it did help them defer the high cost of developing new supplies or new treatment uh, infrastructure, either for drinking water or wastewater. And so that did provide them some current uh, impact. So we, we you know, benefit uh, impact. Um, so we didn't, we didn't really see a strong um, area of complaint about the lost revenue uh, as it was assessed against some of those other issues, but uh, where there was a, a significant amount of unused capacity, that lost revenue was indeed an issue. We also decided to survey companies um, in the area to determine whether upfront funding would be a, a, a motivator toward getting them to implement measures sooner rather than later. Uh, one of the hypotheses we were wanting to test was whether or not some of these industries had current cash flow problems that might prevent them from making some of these efficiency investments. And so we asked them in this survey uh, whether available funding would likely or very likely affect their company's decision to implement water efficiency measures. And 66% of those uh, 37 companies said, yes, we would, we would definitely benefit by using um, loan money or a low interest loan money that might be made available. Um, another question um, that, that it responded to was um, water efficiency improvements, were they planned but not implemented because of a lack of available funding? And 36% said yes. Um, interestingly, 25% said unsure. And, and I think probably that answer is because they had not really rolled it up the chain to upper management to determine whether or not you know, that funding was absolutely needed. But 36% was, was a significant number, and we wanted to at least uh, convey that as part of the results of the project. We also asked them about interest rates. Um, so we asked, you know, interest rates are 5% or lower. Would, would that encourage decisions on facility improvements? And 60% uh, said yes. Um, we asked, uh, do you need to be able to document payback times of two years or less? 45% said yes. And we also asked, would they undertake projects 
with payback times of five years or more. And a full 26% said yes. So that was also an interesting finding that we, uh, we thought we would pass on to you. Um, so although we, we live in a world of fast payback periods, there were a number of, of respondents out there who said, no, we, we would look at five years or more. Um, that would still be of interest to us. So what we did uh, as part of this project uh, was we did develop a, a structure for a revolving loan fund. Uh, we, were, we are still hopeful that a revolving loan fund can be created uh, for specifically for industrial water use efficiency retrofits. Uh, the money would be lent and then repaid once the facility was uh, the benefits, the financial benefits from the, from the improvement were yielding you know, the money to pay back the loan so there would be you know, fixed payback loan periods and then that, that would replenish the fund. So we are interested still in doing that. We would like to set up a revolving loan fund, you know, maybe not just limited to the Great Lakes but make it national. And so we are looking for funders who might be interested in helping to seed that. So at this point, we, we're ready to wrap up. We have some conclusions and recommendations. And I'd um, like to turn it over to Ken Mervis, one of our project team members, uh, to um, do that uh, for you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, we have noted just a couple of conclusions and taken that information to build some recommendations for where does this work move into the future. Uh, one of the things we've not noted that kind of underlies these conclusions is that because the Great Lakes Basin is so water rich, uh, the price of water is historically very low. So these, these findings that we've presented in this webinar are based on the fact that um, it, these industries are not paying very much for water in the first place. So when we find these kinds of cost-effective opportunities, uh, there's a lot of meaning in that. Um, and, and we found that even in this basin, water supply reliability increased, pumping declined significantly, and along with pumping, treatment and all of the related costs. Uh, so at that level, a lot of benefits. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. We, as Jeff, uh, as Jeff Edstrom presented, we uh, are able to protect the wastewater stream. We particularly saw that in the tannery, but it was so dramatic in the tannery where they, uh, they had very little opportunity on site for pretreatment, so they were releasing a lot of water with uh, high levels of VOD and uh, suspended solids into the wastewater stream. And by um, using less and finding um, treatment opportunities on site, there, there can be kind of expansive benefits beyond just conservation itself. Next. We're going to make some recommendations here. These are our recommendations for the future. Uh, we looked only at these five specific industrial areas, industrial sites, and we generalized from that into five industry sectors, but there are still lots of sectors and subsectors that we have not pursued at all. A lot related to food processing. Concrete batching, we did visit in our early site visits a concrete batching plant and found that there's tremendous opportunities for savings, uh, particularly as related to cleaning the tanks after the concrete has been mixed and delivered. Um, but we didn't explore it, so we really don't have any numbers to be able to, to uh, generalize from. Likewise, as Tom mentioned, we uh, think pharmaceuticals would provide a lot of additional opportunity, um, but they did not become part of our um, five industry sample, and what we did find is in that particular region, the number of pharmaceutical companies was on the decline. But looking into additional industries we think will uh, yield a lot of interesting information. Next, please. As Jeff Edstrom mentioned, the Great Lakes themselves contain six quadrillion gallons of water. There's almost nothing that we could do that would have a significant effect on the levels of the Great Lakes, and that's why we looked much more deeply into the ecosystems. And as this project moves forward, um, we think it would be important to concentrate on areas with stress supplies. Um, especially where the water is drawn from streams or aquifers rather than the lakes themselves. 
And the next slide shows a map of the vast area that we're talking about if we were able to, um, to focus just a little bit more. All of the red crosshatched areas in, um, in this map are areas with either groundwater or surface water uh, that are somewhat stressed that we could focus on. And uh, there's just an immense number of industries there. One of the striking things to me is how it spans the entire southern tier of Michigan. And you can imagine the amount of industrial activity taking place there. Uh, so by focusing on these areas does not limit the amount of opportunity. It just um, raises the bar on the amount that could be found, the amount of water that could be saved. Next, please. There, as Marianne mentioned in the survey results, there are some utilities that really could benefit from conservation and others less so. So as we create another subset to concentrate future efforts on, it would be those utilities that are in water stressed areas or experiencing rapid growth, those who've got infrastructure concerns and, and high variable costs related to pumping and treatment. Um, and, and we realize that all areas would realize environmental benefits, um, but not they would not all realize it equally. And so as we move forward, we can try to maximize the, uh, the benefit. Next, please. As Jeff further mentioned, in looking at these sites, these are industrial facilities, so they tend to have huge footprints with a lot of capturable water. And so in almost every facility we looked at, not all of the water needs to be of the quality of treated drinking water. Um, so by capturing water and treating it to some minimal level, um, there could be a, a, a whole lot of provided treated water no longer used. And in addition, uh, it would protect the environment from additional storm surges and combined sewer overflows. Next. This, oh, funding options. Um, I, I think we were all really kind of uh, taken by the fact that only about half the industries we surveyed felt that having access to available funding would make a difference. They were, they were constrained by personnel. They were constrained by, uh, by budget cycles. But those that said they were constrained by budget were really, or by funding, were really constrained by funding. And uh, they were, they were um, pretty enthusiastic in their response that if zero interest or low interest money were made available to them, they would be much more uh, bullish on undertaking conservation projects. Next slide. The takeaway lesson, and it, it keeps reverberating, is that we looked, we didn't even realize this at the time, but we looked at what might be the single most water rich area in the world industrialized area in the world. If not the most, it's certainly one of the most. And, and it's an area where in and of itself one might argue that conservation has minimal effect. And what we found was just the opposite. We found such an, uh, a, a, a series of layers of places where conservation had tremendous beneficial effect, not only on the environment but also on the profitability of um, uh, of the industries we looked at, uh, the cash outlays, and on the infrastructure management and resource management of the utilities. Um, so not having adequate water sources to begin with uh, is just not a viable uh, argument for why not conserve. Um, it, it has benefits far beyond the obvious. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Marianne for questions and conclusions. Okay, thank you very much to all the speakers. And, um, you know, I, as I was listening to Ken summarize the project, I was thinking about the fact that we only really surveyed, uh, audited five sites. Um, we would have loved to have done many more than that, uh, but the funding that was available to us was limited to us choosing only five. And we tried to choose what was the most representative sample of those industries that might give us 
the conclusions that we, the type of conclusions that we could present today. But as uh, as we outlined during the presentation, there are a number of other sectors that that need also some meaningful analysis, and and that would uh, contribute, I think, further to uh, refining and, and enhancing the conclusions. Um, but at this point, I think we finished our, our, our presentation. We've done it in just about exactly 60 minutes. So thanks to all the speakers for their, um, their uh, promptness in, in getting through their slides. And so now I think we're ready to go to the questions. Hopefully you have thought of questions as we were going through the, um, the uh, presentation. And um, before I turn it over to Jeffrey to have him read the questions, just like to let you know that the webinar that's been recorded will be available within a few days. We will post it on our website. We will also post the presentation itself. So if you just wanted to download the presentation, we will have that available as well uh, on our website. We have a, a page devoted to this project. You can access it right from our home page and click right into that page. And all of that material will be uh, posted and available. And if you have any questions about the project or any follow-up uh, after this webinar that you'd like to discuss, um, I've given you my email address here so that you can get in touch with me with uh, any additional issues that you might want to, um, to discuss. But I think this is your opportunity to ask questions. So I'd like to ask Jeffrey if we've received any questions that we can um, have our speakers answer. Uh, yes, thanks, Marianne. We actually have received a number of them, and so I just wanted to start off with uh, first received, first question asked. So um, I think this was it came in when Tom was speaking. What form of treatment was used for the reclaimed from RO and test water? Uh, the treatment of the RO, the reuse was. Um, uh, there was nothing for what it was going to be used for. There was no additional treatment of the RO water. Um, once it was mixed with the test water, uh, the total dissolved solids was still at a level that it was completely usable in the test water facility. Uh, even though they were reusing the water in the test facility in order to keep the water from going septic, the recommendation was that every three or four days, uh, drain the tank and start with fresh water. So it wasn't going to be a complete elimination of water use. Um, uh, they, they were either going to have to put some sort of sanitation solution into the water to keep it from going septic, or they were going to have to drain the tank every you know once a week or so. I hope that I'm answering the right question or how I interpret the question was right. Thanks, Tom. Um, Second question is, can you provide a little more detail regarding the phone control at the brewery? Uh, the current foam, the, the, what they did was they changed their process, actually. We had, I, we assumed, because we didn't want to change anyone's manufacturing process. So we had recommended that they put um, the end of the overflow tube instead of having it spill onto the floor to put it into a larger uh, barrel and then if you added some silicon di dioxide uh, solution which is a food grade de foaming agent uh, they could prevent the foam from spilling out onto the floor um, instead they chose to change the process slightly and I think all they really had to do was either slow down the fermentation or they could have uh, put lower amount of uh, wort into the tank while it was fermenting because eventually there's a certain scale where the foam uh, at some height was going to cause, the, the weight of the foam itself was going to cause it to collapse upon itself. So I'm not sure what exactly change they made, but I know they did, they decided not to do, they said they changed the process rather than put in a uh, barrel, a kept barrel with a defoaming agent. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, next question is, can Jeff Edstrom comment on the stressed watershed slide and its relation to his slide on water sources? I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? Can you uh, comment on the, on the stressed wa on your stressed watershed slides and its relation to your slide on water sources? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, what you find 
um, with the, the, the stressed watersheds. And the stressed watersheds were identified by the Great Lakes Commission, I should add, uh, in one of their projects for the Great Lakes Protection Fund. The stressed watersheds would indicate that there are a lot of areas that are on groundwater that are stressed. Uh, they, there are some areas where the, the surface water um, supplied areas are stressed as well, but not as many. It's, it's primarily, I think, related to stormwater management, particularly in agricultural areas uh, where you've got a lot of water being pushed through uh, uh, drain tile. Um, and that's affecting groundwater sources, especially what might be available for public water supply nearby. Um, so it's, it's, it's an issue that we need to think about the, the, the different water cycles and how each of them is impacting supply as well as uh, the ecology. Okay, thank you so much. A uh, question here about the auditing process. Would you be able to provide the industrial water audit template that was used for this project? I take that questions for me. Um, well, here's the problem with that. Uh, I have conducted almost a thousand water audits. Our engineer has conducted many more than that. There really is not a template because when you get into industrial facilities, the only thing that really remains the same somewhat is the sanitary fixtures. Um, so it's really a tough investigative process. Um, and you kind of create your own spreadsheets and your own formulas to calculate savings um, and benefit cost. Uh, basically, they're custom to the facility itself. Um, certainly, if we did another brewery, we might be able, if we were, knew we were going to do many breweries, we could create a template for that. Or if we we're going to do many um, hide tanning, we would create a template. But it was all kind of custom made for each facility as is the norm. Um, there's been many attempts to create templates and they just aren't very useful we find. And I think most commercial and industrial water auditors will would agree the same thing. Nobody really has good templates. Thank you. Um, if I could just add to what Tom said, um, we get that kind of request a lot, um, and we have been trying to figure out a way that we could come up with at least some kind of auditor checklist, and that's uh, a project that we would love to do if we can find the funding for it, come up with um, you know, sort of a guidebook, a master auditor's guidebook checklist of things to look for. Um, as Tom says, everything is very site-specific, but um, uh, unless you're apprenticing with a master auditor, how do you learn what to look for? So w this is something we're thinking about at the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and um, we would love to talk further about this idea uh, in the future. Uh, thanks, Marianne. Let me see here. Um, next question here is, uh, the total savings of 66 million gallons a year is what percent of total water consumption of these facilities. Uh, I, I'd have to look at the report to calculate that. Um, uh, this is Tom talking. Um, one of the things we were doing, we, because of the limited of funding, we did not do a complete water balance on the facility um, for each facility, meaning we didn't try to identify gallon by gallon every where each water was being used. We were looking at the places, um, the the end uses that there was potential for water savings, and if they had meters on those end uses, or there was any, a lot of them did have meters. Um, we were just looking on that to take a facility that uses billions and billions of gallons of water and to try and do a complete um, what we call a, a a water complete budget and know where every drop is going where was was just much too con time consuming and even amongst the facilities you have to understand with this much water use there could be 30 or 40 different water meters serving um, the facility um, some of them very large complex and so uh, that was not done Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
generally speaking, how transferable are the water efficiency measures to other locations? I, I would say they're, uh, well, let's see. When you're looking at things like cooling towers, very transferable. If you're looking at um, some facilities in general are transferable but not specific, meaning that uh, single pass cooling water is single pass cooling water. Um, and you can almost always eliminate that or find a reuse for it. Um, so, but uh, the calculations and everything we did for rectifiers, well, where are you going to find rectifiers? You'll probably find them in metal platers. You're not going to find them any place else. So to some degree, parts of it would be very transferable. Um, uh, but specific to that industry, metal platers are all pretty much the same, but you do have circuit board platers that are a little bit different. Breweries are many times the same, um, but if they're using an older brewery with older equipment, the retrofits may not work. We were working with a relatively new uh, facility with new equipment, and they had built their own CIP system, the clean and play system, so the facility engineer knew it very well. He knew how it could be adapted. He knew how he could reuse some of the water we were suggesting reuse that may not be transferable in another, another facility. Okay, thanks Tom. Um, how about, were there any issues or are there any issues with water rights restricting rainwater harvesting? Uh, in the states we were in, I knew of no restrictions as such. Um, uh, this comes up, color Colorado is most known for having uh, laws restricting rainwater harvesting, but um, from what we could look in the states we were dealing with, I could find uh, through internet search of the state of uh, statutes and local uh, laws, I could find no thing that stopped anyone from rainwater harvesting. Thank you. Uh, folks here wondering if the savings were solely based on water charge rates or include energy savings and what the charge rate ranged across the five case studies? Uh, I think if you the full report has it, I don't know it offhand, there was a pretty wide variety in the, the cost of the water and wastewater. Uh, wastewater seemed to be a little bit more variable than the water cost, surprising the amount of difference in the cost. Um, so that was the water. What was the other part of the question? Could you repeat that, please? Uh, what was the, um, I'm sorry, uh, wondering if the savings were solely based on those water charge rates or did it include energy savings? And we, yeah. yeah, we included the energy savings for the site itself in the facility where there were energy savings, but for the benefit cost, and, uh, and there was only a, really a couple of places, um, for instance, we found uh, the rectifier water um, in the metal plater, for instance, um, was warm water, and the metal plater needed a warm water solution to create the electroplating process. So we calculated the savings of, of you reusing the rectifier water, which was already warm, and them not having to heat water to, to put into the solution. Um, so there were several cases where we could find some significant direct benefit um, for energy savings, but that wasn't a big picture. We And we certainly didn't look at the embedded cost of energy in the water, anything like that. We just looked at on site. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Question here, are there any other recent studies on the impact of reduced reduced discharges on receiving stream flow, especially in wet environments? I think Jeff could probably answer that better than myself. Yeah, um, there are some studies uh, that I don't know off the top of my head, I have to admit, but uh, USGS has been looking at flows on different streams, and I can uh, get some references for the person. Uh, thank you. Uh, question here is, um, is the alliance or the respective utilities monitoring actual savings for those companies who made changes? Um, I'll take that one, Marianne. Um, we 
We have not developed any plans for follow-up. Uh, the project that we did for the Great Lakes Protection Fund is, has been concluded, and um, at this point we are not authorized to circle back and do any further evaluation of what they've actually implemented and what the continuing savings documented uh, uh, water bill reductions might be for those industries. Uh, it's something we would love to do, so uh, you've given us a good idea to go back and talk to the Great Lakes Protection Fund about that uh, so that we could actually document whatever might have been done as a result of our recommendations. Each of the five industries was provided with a very detailed audit an assessment report that not only gave them all of the information that, that was determined by the auditors on site, but the recommendations uh, for future action, and they were provided to the facility managers at each of those locations. So um, well, it would be interesting to see how much of that they do end up implementing. All right. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, another question here is, if a particular process was not metered, and you did not look at total water use, how much, how much estimation went into the savings numbers? Uh, I, I would say we could be plus or minus 10%. And the reason I feel that accurate, that um, confident about that is, is you have to understand if you're, if you're doing an industrial facility, you really can't do it without the facility engineer or the process engineer at our side, and we did that. So um, they were very confident about how much uh, water was used. And you have to understand, um, the reason they their confidence was they, they know that if more water is being used or less water is being used than should be, there's probably a problem within the process and that affects the quality of the product and the, and the durability of the machinery used. So they, I, I feel very confident we were plus or minus 10%. Okay, thank you. Um, and with that, I, I don't have any other submitted questions. Okay, well, thank you all of you very much for participating in this webinar. Um, we are very interested in this subject matter, and this was our first project, industrial water use efficiency project uh, for the Alliance. It's something we would like to pursue. Uh, your questions have gotten at all of the, the long-term issues that need to be explored in terms of a more complete evaluation, so we are, we're very grateful for your participation. And, um, you know, we'll look forward to maybe doing more of this work in the future. As I mentioned, we're very interested in trying to come up with uh, additional, not only technical support materials for industries, but, you know, some way to help with the financing of that. So those, both of those will be areas that we will be looking uh, to do in the, in the next, uh, you know, 24 months or so. So thank you all for participating in this webinar. And uh, as I mentioned, we will post the PowerPoint presentation, uh, you know, shortly after this webinar. And when the recording has been completed, we will post that as well. So thanks again for your participation. And thanks to the speakers for their excellent uh, presentations.